Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the Oraculos True Divination Podcast, where I bring you ancient wisdom for the modern mystic. I'm your host, Michael A. Bryan, and joining me today all the way from Seattle is Mr. Eric Perdue. Eric, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. <laughs> Eric, you I am super excited to dive into our conversation that we're going to have today. But before we go there, for those of you who this is your first time joining us here on the Oraculos True Divination Podcast, this is a podcast where I bring you interviews from astrologers and mystics all around the world who aren't just changing their own lives through their astrological practice, but they're also actively changing this greater landscape of this astrology that we know and love. So if you want to be a part of the magic and the momentum, that we're building here on the Oraculos True Divination Podcast. Give yourself a moment, go down below, like this amazing interview because you know it's going to be great, but also subscribe to the Oraculos True Divination Podcast and hit the notification bell so that you receive notifications of when I bring you these interviews each and every week. Now, Eric, once again, thank yes. you so much for sharing this space with mm -hmm. me. Thank you. Now, Eric, you and I have so much to talk about. We have your spiritual practice to talk about. We have your astrological practice to talk about. We have your practice as an author to talk about. And I think the best place for us to start is for you, Eric, to tell us who you are and also how you found yourself interested in astrology, magic, and the entire corpus of esotericism. Okay. Astrology was the end of the story, basically. Not the end, the middle of the story. Uh, the end hasn't happened yet. Um, Good for you. <laughs> so uh, basically, I became seriously interested in magic when I was about, I would say, 18. And uh, I just read random books like everyone else does. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in the late 80s, um, the, there wasn't as much out there. There was no internet. So um, I, you know, I did what everybody else did, picked up some Aleister Crowley, uh, read some books about the Golden Dawn. I figured that was where I needed to go. Um, so I started looking for a teacher. And uh, this was in Illinois. Uh, I, uh, at the time, I lived in Chicago. And um, I was a musician at the time. I uh, met someone who I started playing with, and he recommended this very serious mystic um, who could change his, the color of his eyes at will and all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> it's very scary and spooky. And uh, gave me his number, and he had a very strange-sounding name, which I didn't understand what that, where it came from. Uh, he said, okay, call this number. And I said, well, what do I tell him? And he says, tell him you want to make an appointment. I said, for what? <laughs> <clears throat> he, said, tell, he said, he'll know what you mean. Just tell him you know, that you want to make an appointment. I'm like, okay, this is like a drug deal or something. I called the number. Uh, a very aristocratic gentleman answered the phone. And he said, uh, I said, this is Rodun. He goes, speaking. And I said, I would like to make an appointment. And he said, for what? <laughs> <laughs> so we made the appointment to talk, basically. Um, I met him. Uh, he was in a, a building, was a 19th century looking apothecary with mysterious jars. I mean, it's what you see in a movie, mysterious jars with powders and roots and things like that in it. Um, at the time, I didn't know this. It was one of the few places in Chicago where you could buy bulk incenses and roots and things like that. Um, anyway, we talked for hours, I uh, showed him what I'd been reading, which is Crowley and, uh, or Crowley, I'm an American <laughs> and a, uh, a book about the golden dawn. And he took one look at it <laughs> through, <laughs> through over there <laughs> somewhere in the corner. And we talked for hours and then he gave me a reading, which I found out later was a Dilagoon reading. Didn't know that. And, uh, proceeded to tell me about my life. He told me things about myself that I never told anybody. And I said to myself, I wanted what he has. So um, we, we talked quite a bit over the la next few months. I visited him almost once a week. 
um, I didn't know that it was leukemia at the time. And there was no talk about African this, Yoruban that, Cuban this, you know, none of that. He wasn't um, obviously Cuban. He had a sort of an English accent. Um, turned out later he was born in Havana. He didn't tell anybody that. And um, over the over time, I just got more and more hooked. And um, so I got my Alekes, the necklaces, and I was 19 and uh, kind of went from there. And he, he was a bit unusual. He was also interested in a lot of Western occult as well. Um, a lot of Lukumi, Olderishas or Santeros are not necessarily into that, uh, but he was. He introduced me to Agrippa uh, early on, and he also introduced me to the Picatrix way before people were talking about it. I, uh, I didn't hear anybody else talk about it back then. This was in the 90s. Um, I don't think he was aware of any of the Warburg Institute critical editions um, that were out at that point. Um, I don't think he was aware of that. And um, so I was sort of on this quest to find this mysterious Picatrix somewhere, which I knew was astrological magic. And um, I didn't find it until he passed away uh, years later. But um, yeah, so astrology was kind of in the background. He did astrology not very well in retrospect. Um, I was initiated as a, as a Santero Olderisha in, uh, 2000. Um, he passed in 2005. And the first thing I did after he passed was to sort of go back to my roots. And I'm like, well, what about this Agrippa guy? And, um, and the Picatrix, I, I found out that there are these books on, you know, already out there. Uh, none of it was translated yet into English, except for the, or Burroughs translation. And, um, I started reading Agrippa and I'm like, okay, this, this astrology is different than what I'd heard about. Um, I didn't understand what to, what to do about that. Um, someone told me about William Lilly's Christian astrology. I bought that on a whim. I realized that that was what I was looking for all along and I became hooked. And um, a few years later, I started translating Agrippa and I had this double life as a leukemia <laughs> Santero and an astrologer slash astrological magician. Um, so, how have you found your astrological interests grafting themselves onto your larger spiritual practice? Did you find that it was an easy integration, or are there things between astrology and Lukumi that don't necessarily? Uh, go together because I know that you mentioned that a lot of the other people within that tradition don't necessarily have the same interest in the Western esoteric tradition like your teacher did. Is there a reason for that? I just think that in the Lukumi world, a lot of people, well, especially Cubans and Puerto Ricans, grow up with it. And uh, that's that's just part of the background worldview. And um, I, I just think that the, the, a lot of the Western occult practices, it's complicated because if you go to a botanica, you find some of the, you find some of the, you know, grimoires there, um, sometimes translated in Spanish. Um, so it's kind of there, but I haven't really met many who are seriously interested in it. Um, I think that a lot of times the outlook is, you know, this is also magic. And sometimes the certain things might be, Kind of privately done. It's not part. Leukemia is its own practice. I mean, leukemia is its own religion. Um, it doesn't really need help from a grimoire to flesh it out. It's pretty fleshed out already. Um, but what people do on their own is is a different thing. Um, I mean, people talk about hoodoo being um, part of that, and you know, they don't really have in Cuba. They don't really have hoodoo as a, as a word or as a concept, but the magic in hoodoo is also done by people on their own outside of leukemia. Um, so I think that leukemia has informed my approach to astrology in that I, I recognize the spiritual side of astrology much easier. It's much easier, easier to believe that. Um, you know, as you know, in astrology, there's a bit of a um, argument whether uh, 
I guess, to the degree of how much spirituality falls into astrological practice or how much of it is, you know, quote, scientific. Um, so it's much easier to me, for me to see that, that spiritual side of it. Um, I think that since Lucumi has forced me to develop my mediumship, I approach um, astrological, tr astrological charts differently as well. I, I do the astrology, but my mediumship is going to tell me different things or, or elaborate on what the astrology is telling me. Um, that, that just automatically happens. Um, on, in the same token, astrology has a certain worldview that I view as kind of universal. And, um, and leukemia does kind of fit into that. But I never actually mix the two of them together ever. Um, they're, they're, they're their own. I, I guess look, there are two continents in the same world, <laughs> in the Eric world. It's really interesting, Eric, this concept that the Lukumi allowed you to enter into astrological space with a more open heart or a more open mind that was ready for the worldview that astrology specifically speaks towards. Because I think the more we go back towards indigenous forms of spirituality or indigenous religious practices, the more we find there being a certain mutual understanding that there are deeper mechanisms that inform our cosmos. And if you're entering your astrological practice from that perspective, you also are kind of entering your astrological practice from the perspective that these are just givens. The fact that there is a relationship between the earth and the sky is just a given as a further extension of my larger spiritual life. But something I wanted to ask you, because you mentioned that Lukumi is a standalone religion within itself. I know that there has been talk in the past about astrology and whether or not astrology is a spiritual practice or whether or not it can be a religion within itself. Do you find that astrology has the inner structure for it also to be something comparable to a standalone religion of sorts? Or do you think that astrology is of a different category altogether? I don't see, I don't think astrology can ever be a religion per se, because a religion has to, uh, a religion isn't just a loose set of spiritual practices or a worldview or a practice. A religion has to have, it's, a religion is a collection of spiritual practices around a framework, I guess, is a way to think about it. Astrology um, is a worldview that has throughout history, since its beginning, that attaches itself to different philosophies and different um, religions. So that, that's why, you know, ancient Greeks could practice a, the same astrology, more or less, that Muslims could practice and, and Christians can practice. It's not uh, separate from, it's, it's a, how, how do I say it? It's, um, um, it's, it's, it's an, like, sort of like an inner, um, database <laughs> that can that can sort of be applied in many different ways. Um, it's a Swiss Army knife. I think that one of the biggest things that we've we've run into, um, I, I think that's more and more people are seeing today is that um, you know when I first started getting interested in, in astrology um, in the nineties, um, you know that that kind of coincides with the very beginning of serious translations in. Uh, ancient astrology, astrological texts were starting to come out. Even even in Western magic, there weren't that many um, older texts available. Um, it was just the same Victorian um, texts kind of repackaged o over and over again. Um, plus, you know, over the years, we've kind of, you know, what the, the Western world has kind of lost touch with its spirituality um, as a whole. Um, one of the things that I think all astrologies have in common uh, up until, and this is a rough number, 1700s, that's a convenient number, is that co that coincides with the beginning of the scientific worldview. And ever since then, it's been, it's hard for many people to figure out where astrology and where magic fits in with that. 
So the result is that many people have become kind of schizophrenic about their spirituality, uh, where they they know that you know Earth revolves around the sun, uh, re revolves around the sun, um, but then they're dealing with this astrology where it's geocentric. Um, they know that um, you know spirits cannot be proven scientifically or ghosts or whatever. Um, yet you're dealing with magic. And I think that magicians have had an easier time adapting to that than astrologers have as a whole. I think it's gradually changing uh, because we have more and more available to us. But I think that it's important to remember that the worldview that we have today is completely different than it was in the ancient world um, in the sense that in the ancient world, of the world of Agrippa, the world of William Lilly, they took it for granted that uh, astrology was just a thing that existed and that spirits existed. Um, William, you know, William Lilly, you know, I don't know how much he practiced, but he at least owned a co uh, had a copy of Picatrix. He was definitely familiar with it. Uh, this was just part of the world. Um, so that, you know, I, I've often said that, you know, William Lilly reading, you know, Vedius Valens in the, was it second century? Um, would be much, he would be much more familiar with that astrology, even though it was a little bit different, than William Lilly would understand reading, you know, Dave Rudyard today. Even though the, even though the span of time is much less, um, this is not a linear. This is not linear time we're talking about. It's 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 because our entire outlook today is completely different. I think that more and more astrologers today are becoming comfortable though with it. Um, you know, no one was was really talking about astrological magic before the '90s, not seriously. And, um, and now that Picatrix is now available in you know, two series translations, and a third one's coming out soon uh, from the Arabic. And um, you know, people are reading uh, Agrippa seriously, and people are looking at, this, at the, some of these Arabic astrological texts and some of the medieval Latin astrological texts. They can actually read them. Uh, we have uh, very good translations of grimoires, much better than we've, we've ever had. Um, over the last 15 years or so. Uh, the world's changing quite a bit. Um, and I think that many uh, magicians and astrologers are now able to more comfortably uh, agree that there's this objective physical world, but there's this unseen world beneath that um, simultaneously. So you can have a scientific reality like the world being round and the earth revolving around the sun and there being gravity and things like that that can be measured, but also have interaction with spirits that cannot be scientifically proven. And leukemia helped me with that quite a bit because, you know, I experienced and saw things that, you know, <laughs> frankly, were pretty crazy. Um, and so walking into astrology and taking older astrology, on face value and seeing it not as just a map of my psyche and actually looking at it as divination uh, was, you know, kind of a, it, it was easier for me to fall into that thinking, um, I think. So. Now, Eric, I've heard you mention Cornelius Agrippa a few times, and I know mm -hmm. that you have done a mammoth amount of work in terms of the translation of his three books of occult philosophy. Can you tell us a bit about what drew you into the studying of Agrippa's work? And why did you think that translating that work was such a necessary thing to do? So I first started reading Agrippa very casually and on a whim. Uh, my um, teacher slash godfather, I know a lot of people aren't familiar with that term, um, introduced me to Agrippa. Uh, though he, he, he told me that Agrippa corresponded to the second book of Picatrix, which isn't true. He, he hadn't read Picatrix. So, um, so I bought a grip. I found Agrippa on a whim after he passed. And since I didn't think I was going to find Picatrix, I said, well, at least I can get part of it. And I started re reading it. It was the Tyson edition that everybody has. And everything was fine. I read it cover to cover. Um, when I started studying uh, traditional astrology, I realized that some of that translation didn't make sense. And 
it did, and also I didn't really realize before I read it that astro astrological magic as a, I guess, a detailed study even existed either. Um, I just figured it was casual natal charts, maybe doing a couple of casual elections, no big deal. Um, and, it, you know, Grippa introduced me to that more detailed, I guess, um, approach to it. Um, so I, I could tell right away that some of the translations were off, um, especially with the astrology. Um, so a few years later on a whim, uh, and actually my first project was translating Picatrix, which I abandoned when I found out Chris Warner and John Michael Greer were doing it. I figured I was struggling with, with, with it anyway, and I'm like, I'll, I'll let them have it. <laughs> I'm not going to argue that one. So I started with Agrippa. And I think I started noticing problems in the first, I don't know, five chapters. Um, I did a couple chapters as a test, which were tiny. And, um, and also after about five chapters, I realized that Tyson hadn't um, noted almost any of Agrippa's primary sources, um, which is not, I don't think really Tyson's fault, but... Um, he listed a lot of secondary sources um, or he kind of guessed in some cases. And, um, and then the, the mistranslations, just the original, the translation that, that Tyson was working, that everybody's been working with, it's the same translation uh, from 1651, uh, was off. And the astrology was very, very off, but there was a lot of um, just scattered, just strange things. Uh, the deeper I got into the book, I realized that some of the graphics were rotated like the sigils were rotated in some cases um which should drive a few magicians crazy um <laughs> realizing that um so yeah i just realized i had to start this thing from scratch so i went back to the latin and and located almost all of a group of sources about 200 of them um they're all available by the way almost all of them are available um, and I was able to cross check Agrippa's statements with the sources that he made and a few cases found a couple of errors that Agrippa wrote and I was able to correct those as well. Not very many. He was pretty good about that. So. How do you feel the work of Agrippa ties into the practice of the 21st century traditional magician or astrologer. How do you think diving into that work actually allows us to create a richer framework for our connection to both magic and astrology? Uh, it's extremely important because as I mentioned earlier, most people approach both magic and astrology um, not from a traditional outlook. From a, I guess from a, they, they look at it, they're using ancient um, practices with a modern outlook. That's kind of a different way to say it. And um, I, I've, I found in my personal life that approaching all of these things from their, as much as possible from its own, um, taking it on its own terms, um, changes everything. So instead of second guessing it, like, well, okay, well, that's old. We don't need to worry about that anymore or that's impossible, uh, or we have better ways to do it today, that kind of thinking, um, I think is detrimental to the results that you're getting um, out of both the astrology and the magic. Uh, Agrippa is important because he methodically lays out the entire foundation of how magic and astrology works from a traditional standpoint. Um, and, you know, I've told people many times before about this that it's less important that you follow what Agrippa is specifically saying. Because, um, he, you know, he has some examples that, you know, if you take them literally don't really make sense today. But what's more important is that, A, you're asking the right questions. Um, and B, he's giving you a place to start with. Um, so, it, you know, if, you know, one of the examples I give is, he gives an example uh, of a mythical animal. Um, it's, a, it's a fish that turns ship to, ships to stone by touching them. 
And we know it's a mythical fish. We know the fish never existed ever. Um, so it's easy to dismiss the entire statement as anachronistic. Um, but what you miss is what Agrippa is talking about. <laughs> it's, he, he mentions this in conjunction with um, magical contagion, you know, when, which is one of the main concepts of magic. I mean, even in leukemia, I mean, just by putting the thing in there makes it, makes it magical. Um, just this example kind of sucks, <laughs> you know, really. So if you, if you read what he's actually saying, um, you know, keep in mind that some of his examples are mythical. Um, he likes to use verse from Virgil, Homer, people like that to strengthen his arguments. But you, you, you look, you read it, take it on its own terms. But if you take into account what he's actually talking about, that, you know, that there's this flow of power from, you know, the very highest of which to him would be just God. Uh, down to you know the intelligences and to the plants and then eventually to the elements uh, and then to earth that's kind of what the book's about is this sort of flow of influence that happens between heaven and earth and then from earth back to heaven and um, and, and the rest of the book is an elaboration of that <laughs> that simple concept and you know today people like to say as above uh, as above so below all the time um, but I, I think a lot of people don't think about the sort of bi-directional, you know, influence that is happening. So it isn't just as above, so below. It's also as below, so above. That's actually in the original text anyway. And, um, um, so if you read a grip on these terms, it's like, okay, well, he's taking, he's taking these very simple magical truths that anybody doing magic or astrology pretty much believe in, uh, have experienced. And he's giving you this entire, you know, medieval scientific explanation of how everything works, uh, it will definitely richen your understanding um, of, of this. And you're no longer um, as two-headed about, about the magic. So you have this sort of like very modern outlook on things, then you have this very, but you're doing this very ancient science and all of a sudden those things kind of, you know, kind of start to come together much easier for you. Um, and you, you have much less conflict, I think, in your mind. And um, for me, that process started with my leukemia practice uh, without my knowledge, because uh, I was suddenly confronted with um, divinations and uh, spirit contact, contacts, which you only read about in books. And, but it's very common in a lot of, these, in a lot of African religions. Um, so I, I, I was basically slapped over the face, almost literally, <laughs> <laughs> in some cases, with with these these truths, and then going into astrology, I found this um, disconnect happening. You know, so Agrippa helps with that. Eric, when you reclaimed these magical roots of astrology within the shape of your own astrology, how do you think that reclamation of a magical understanding? impacted your own practice of astrology did it do something for you the 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 magical integration that wasn't happening before yes yeah, so hermeticism is kind of thrown about a lot the word um astrology really was is never was never meant to be practiced by itself um i mean technically i'm a hypocrite here because there's only three branches um, the three branches of hermeticism are, are astrology, magic, and alchemy. I'm, I, I've not really studied alchemy in it in seriously yet. Um, that's where I'm a hypocrite. I need. To, I should do that. Um, but it, it's it's a lot of magicians today um, are not interested in astrology. Um, some are, but most aren't, and most astrologers are not interested in magic, and so they, they take this very highly specialized approach. So I think doing the magic, really the magic is taking the astrology and putting it to work for you. Uh, you know, a lot of astrology is kind of passive, I guess. Um, so if you're, if you're doing your natal chart, you're, um, you're kind of passively looking at what, what, what those things are doing to you. 
<laughs> all the planets are doing to you. And if you're doing, um, you know, electro astrology is a little bit more active, I suppose, because you're, 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 you're looking for times, but you're kind of like almost at the, at the, at the whim of whatever the planets and stars are doing to you. And, and astrological magic is taking those and, and like focusing it on the things that you want it to do for you. And, um, um, so I, I think that that integrating that, uh, was, I, I guess, changed my outlook on astrology as a whole. Um, but from my leukemia influence, I started to also see the role of mediumship in divination in a way that is not really discussed in astrology. Um, astrology tends to be very mechanistic. Um, and frankly, a lot of magicians also approach magic very mechanistically. If you take if you take A plus B, then you should always get C, and it doesn't work that way usually. And even in astrology, it doesn't work that way. Uh, and I think anybody who's done a lot of readings has those few charts or those few, um, I guess charts, yeah, that um, where you say things that you really, sh I mean, it's in the chart technically. But the delineation that you came up with is, is crazy, you know, um, and you probably won't be able to repeat that with that same configuration again. Um, that that's the mediumship. I think everybody's every uh, experienced astrological um, professional has had those experiences. Um, you know, you can't you cannot look at always look at the sun conjunct Mercury as the same thing every single time. Sometimes it, it exhibits different things. So um, eventually when I had this sort of uh, inspiration that like, okay, well, if I consciously work with my spirits when I do astrolog astrological readings, then maybe it's going to help the readings be a little bit more specific sometimes. It doesn't always work. <laughs> um, but it definitely changed my outlook on that because I, I, before I was reading, like we all do, we read these astrology books and they have, they have these recipes for how to read things. And I think all of us have seen, you know, that it doesn't always work that way. So. I think that magical background is really a special thing when we come to astrology. And like you said, our astrology, if given enough time, will take us all into spaces of deeper magical awareness. Mm -hmm. And also like you said so many of us have had this point within our practice and after you've practiced astrology for long enough it becomes these continuous points of magical contact within every chart reading that you give where there is the information that the chart presents there is the politically correct thing to say based on the textbook and what all of the books say but then there's this moment of that process being overridden by something else. And the chart in that moment simply serves as the launching pad for a much deeper unfoldment of magical divine communication, which is essentially divination for that person. And I, I really have always cherished that. And I love the fact that you keep framing the astrological moment in the wider reality of the moment of divination because insofar as divination is the arts and science of communicating with the divine via an established symbolic language mm -hmm. i think that astrology is very much a part of our means of creating a bridge of communion with the divine and it may not necessarily have to do with the chart itself. You know, it, it may not necessarily have to do with the specific aspects that you're looking at, but I think that that chart in that moment can serve as a scrying mirror where you look at the chart. Yes, you know all of your knowledge about how to interpret the chart, but then is there a state? Is there a an, an even and I don't want to scare anyone, but is there a, a trans state within that reading where the part of you that knows how to delineate steps out and is replaced 
by a part of you that knows how to sit within the presence of the divine and speak that wisdom through yourself by way of the chart as a launching pad, but not necessarily as a thing that we're delineating in and of itself by itself. Right. Cause it's, it's, it's like, um, I mean, a good example is that with, with any birth chart, there is somebody else who has an identical birth chart to you. Cause someone else was born around the same time as you in nearly the same place. Um, maybe a couple degrees off here and there, but basically the same chart or twins. And, uh, and those people can have, while there, there's going to be similarities, they're going to have very different lives. So the mechanistic approach is going, are going to make those, a, a twins chart, for instance, um, identical. Um, they're going to get married at the same time. They're going to have the same job. <laughs> they're going to have the same amount of money and all this other, other business. And, um, you know, ever since I've started studying astrology, a lot of people kind of agonize over, well, twin charts, I think, are the easiest because they're so close. Um, they agonize over finding these differences in the two charts. But I think that for me, um, I, I always do the astrology first, uh, mechanistically. But when I actually do, when I, when I actually speak to the person, um, I get different information not different. Uh, I get more information. So while I've never done, I never actually read two twins, you know, side to side. Um, th those, those should be different charts. Those should be not different charts. Those should be different readings. I'm really once again, in awe of that process. And it's something that happened, um, I dare say within the last week for me, I was teaching a class to a group of my students and we were talking about this concept that comes out of Moran of primary motivation and finding the primary motivation within a chart. And we looked at the ruler of the first house and the other houses in the chart that that ruler ruled and created the Moran style linkage between the first house and that other house as being a part of this person's primary motivation. And mm -hmm. to my surprise, which I hadn't realized beforehand, probably seven people in the class all had Scorpio rising, which means that basically the layout of the houses for them was roughly the same as well, even though we mm -hmm. know that that isn't always the case, the basic layout of More the houses, less. Yeah, what well, was more or less the same. And that was the first time I had ever been faced with the closest thing to a, a twins situation, even though, of course, the planets were different and everything. But in analyzing or coming up with a delineation for this quote unquote primary motivation, we found a way within the class to make that specific for the people who whose chart it was, whether or not they shared the same ascendant, we found a way to say, okay, well, where is the ruler of the first house located? And how is that different for this exactly. person versus the other person? And even if it's located in the same place, how is it still expressed in a different way? And I think that that is something beyond the textbook astrology that we learn. I think that is beginning to build a bridge between the astrology that we have been bequeathed by antiquity, as well as this magical process that the astrological act is meant to engender within all of us who practice astrology professionally. I think I think one of the things that we're missing, and this is something that I've, that's been on my mind lately, is you know I basically learn magic through an oral tradition, and which is starkly contrasted with astrology and Western magic which is an almost entirely book-based. And uh, so what's missing is the experience. So, I mean, I think Lily, Lily, Lily might be, and maybe Moran might be exceptions that they have, they have more working charts, but we really don't know what they did with clients. And we especially don't know what Bonatti did or, or, or some of these other astrologers. Um, we, you know, the, the, whoever wrote the, um, the, uh, greater and lesser keys of Solomon, we don't know what they did, really. 
when they actually did the magic. Um, you know, what kind of made me think about that a while back was, I think this was, I think Ben Dykes might have mentioned it in his Abu Ali Kayat translation, that um, there's some speculation, uh, maybe not by him, but <laughs> there's speculation that, um, because Abu Ali Kayat's book is a little bit different than uh, what you see in other Arabic astrologers in the same period. Um, it's a little bit more simplistic. And due to an accident of history, that book became very popular in the Latin West. And that affected the way that we read, we started to do astrology in the West. Um, but there's some speculation, though, with his book, is that that book might have been um, sort of a summarized you know, notebook for his students. So here we have this possibly, you know, um, you know, abbreviated version of what he was teaching his students just so they can help them memorize certain things. Um, then accidentally got released into the wild and that became authoritative. <laughs> and we don't know that with a lot of these grimoires, we don't know how much of it is, we don't know if the person was just writing stuff down. We don't know if the person was actually practicing it. We don't know what they didn't write down. Um, a lot of people have, have worked with these grimoires and had results with them. Uh, I'm not saying that they haven't, um, but there, there's got to be something outside of what the book itself is saying. Um, I'll, I'll probably get in trouble with a few people by saying that. Um, but I, I thought about that, you know, like, you know, I keep talking about leukemia. You know, if you go to Botanica, you can find all sorts of books on leukemia, and um, there are hundreds of them. A couple of them uh, even talk about what you do in specific ceremonies. But there are certain things in those books that really no book writes writes down, um, either accidentally or not. I don't know. But there are certain things I have, you know, I've been to enough initiations and ceremonies to know how we do certain things. And books don't always write everything down. Um, they don't always write down what that sweet spot is in the ceremony that actually makes that, that ritual work. Um, you know, I've never seen anybody talk about what how how's how's the talk about these steps of birthing the orishas um and you can write that down in a book you aren't really supposed to but you could but i've never seen anybody talk about what what what, what, what point are those actually birthed for instance what point during initiation is that person actually initiated <laughs> um so in if you're going by a grimoire um there could be a lot of little nuances that are missing and i've known people who work with certain grimoires a lot, uh, some good friends of mine um, who, you know, they start out by the book, but they start noticing little differences here and they're popping up. And, um, and the astrology should be the same way. You know, yes, we all, we're all, we all start reading the recipes, but eventually, you know, the, di the dish may or may not come out the way the book says. <laughs> and the more experienced you are, the more you start realizing, okay, there's all these little idiosyncrasies that happen or today it works this way, but tomorrow I notice I'm noticing something or I, I, I can't do that tomorrow. Uh, this day it works one way and then another day it works a different way. Um, and I, I've seen that across the board and, and every magic that I've ever done. Um, it's never hundred percent consistent every time you do it. I think this is a really good argument for the reinstatement of oral traditions as being a cornerstone to how we disseminate astrological information today. And by oral tradition, I'm not necessarily referring to you must memorize the entire table of essential dignities in one hour or else, you know, not, not that sort of thing. But what I've found in the way how astrology is taught today to a large degree is this very disembodied voice in the laptop sort of thing where and you know you might get in trouble for saying what you said i might get in trouble for saying what i'm about to say we're all going to get in trouble for doing <laughs> something but in putting together the, the the courses that i teach i always knew that i wanted to have an interaction with the students. I went to Dan school in Cuba for much of my youth. And that was something that I had to get 
in person. There was no way around that. There was no video recording that I could have followed. And even though I could follow videos, there's something different that's imparted to a student who's actually participating in an experience. And so in the way how I share astrology today, I always want to recreate that experience of participation, that participatory involvement with the information. And what I find is that the students who are in class and who are always in the classes, they get they they get this non-tangible thing that you can't really put your finger on, but it's this non-tangible bestowing of something else that's being transmitted. Even though we're all on Zoom, even though we're all sheltering in place, it's this non-tangible thing that's transmitted to the student who chooses to actively show up and participate that the other students who get that same video recording and who watch that video recording later something's missing and they, they could watch the video front way back way all sorts of ways but but not showing up there is something and, and i keep on doing this but it, it, it's a feeling <laughs> it, it, it's a feeling that's that's missing in how they receive that information through a recording versus how another student received that information who was in that live moment well books books and video are dead they're not living um, I think it's important to remember that. I, I yeah, I don't completely have the. I mean, today everything is so. I don't know. I mean, I think I think when I when I first started with magic, um, groups were much more popular, and um, you know, groups of all like whether it was neo pagan, astrological, you know, ceremonial, whatever, groups were more more popular. But but that was before the internet, and you know, the internet has me. It simultaneously brought people together for talking, <laughs> but it has also um, created a sort of a little bit of a distance. And I think that kind of visceral bodily feel of having of being in the same room with people is is kind of missing, and that also creates its own um, activation. I think as well. Um, of course, with COVID, probably not the best idea to do that right now. Um, and I've thought about that a lot. I mean, I'm thinking, okay, well, are groups are are physical groups even the answer and I, I think I mean they're you know, they were they were problematic before the internet, too. Uh, certainly problematic after the internet, or during the internet. I guess we're not after the internet yet. Um. So, but I think that that uh, the interaction helps. I think that um, the part that's I, the part that's missing certainly in astrology is that um, personal student teacher uh, communication. Uh, like you're saying, I think that does that means everything. Um, and the first rule of learning anything esoteric is you have to show up. <laughs> and I think reading, you know, and, and just reading a pre-recorded or watching a pre-recorded video, it's, it's not the same as showing up. And I haven't been able to put a finger on why that is, because one would think that if this person is watching the same class from beginning to end that they would still leave with that essential thing that 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 quintessential thing but it, it doesn't happen and i think that that goes to show that there is something magical about this about well, you it, showing up me showing up mm -hmm. to bring to bring up leukemia cosmology um the most important Part of this whole, of, of pretty much all the processes is this part right here, the head, and this part of the head is called the ori, the O R I, and the ori is like is what's guiding you as a person, and it's also your connection with the divine. And everything you're doing in life, and in, 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 you know, magically, is is either aligning or not aligning your ori with the divine. And when you do a, a leukemia shell reading or, or the, uh, the Opuele um, readings with the Baba Lao, it's the same difference here in what I'm saying, that <clears throat> um, really what's happening is 
the ori of the person being read is connecting with the ori of the person who is reading and there's interaction going on and i think that that spills over into most areas of our life so when you're teaching someone or you're having a conversation there there's a sort of a spiritual exchange happening that's that you don't always know about and i've certainly noticed in astrological readings um i've i've taught people privately um with astrology and look me too and uh no two interactions are the same and it isn't because the person the one person's a slow learner versus a fast learner i think that there's just a there's an interaction happening so you're watching a video of it that's not happening or you're reading a book that's not happening there's no connection happening not that those can't be valuable too. So at what point in time do you think the student is equipped to leave the oral tradition tradition and really launch out into a state of self-learning where books do become an actual boon for them as opposed mm -hmm. to something that further blocks them off from the truth that they're seeking? Well, the books are a guide. And, they should, and I, th I think if you approach the books as guides and not the Bible, <laughs> the end all be all of, of knowledge, um, I think that that learning never really ends. Um, God, at what point does a person go off on their own? I don't know. I don't, I don't know how to answer that. Um, you know, I never consciously made that change myself. Um, it was thrust upon me. I mean, I became a godparent. I didn't ask for it. <laughs> um, I became a teacher. I didn't ask for it. Um, so, but I think that I see astrologers arguing or magicians arguing about minutia in books. And I got into, I got, uh, one time I was, I was, thinking, I was having a friendly argument with, um, a well-known astrologer about a very small detail in um, traditional astrology. And finally I told him, I'm like, look, we're just reading the same book. <laughs> At the end of the day, we're, re we're all reading the same books. Um, but we're, you know, but what's, what's different is, is okay. You know, what, how are you actually approaching it as an individual? And I think my, my style is very different from everybody else, but so, you know, but there's other people's as well. I mean, we're, we should all be, there, there's room in this universe for everyone to have their own approach to any of this, any of the magic and the astrology. We shouldn't be carbon copy, you know, practitioners of, of anything. Um, so, but I think the book, the, the books at the beginning, I think this, this is where teachers, I think are important is the books really should be seen as, as, as a guide, you know, this is the part that's hard to memorize. Have this in a book. Uh, but what do you actually do with it? Essential dignities are a great example. I mean, you can memorize the essential dignities, but what do you do with it? I mean, how do you, how do you deal with the astrological terms or bounds, as some people call it? Very few books to, uh, talk about that. You know, how do you deal with a planet in, that's dignified by triplicity uh, versus a planet which has a, a score of three, uh, versus a planet that is in, um, uh, in in its terms and in Deccan at the same time, which is also a score of three. What's the difference? You know, books don't talk about that usually. Eric, I know that you spend a lot of time investing into getting ready for the publication and the release of your translation of Cornelius Agrippa. What is the main thing that you would want for the readers of your book to take away from that, whether they're astrologers or magicians, what do you really hope that people will gain from interacting with the book? First of all, I hope they read the whole thing, which almost no one does. Um, it's not an easy book to get through. Agrippa in the last chapter being the, I kicked myself here. Um, Agrippa being, I think the troll that he was, in the very last chapter said that some of the material in the book is um, omitted and some is mixed up. 
So if you read the chapter headings, <laughs> they don't necessarily give you the whole story. Um, I know for a fact that some of his material on um, elements are, are also in book three, but they're just not labeled that way. So if you, I would hope that people actually read the entire book and not use it as a reference book. Uh, because again, I think that being able to integrate, you know, if, if since we're all doing, you know, ancient, we're all, you know, we're, I guess we're all interacting with ancient ancient wisdom here by doing magic and astrology. Um, no matter what style of astrology it is, um, that you know we can kind of figure out where people were coming from when these things were developed. Were developed. Um, I think that it will change your approach with astrology and magic quite a bit. Um, there's, you know, you, you have less of this confusion about, okay, what's a spirit? What's a demon? What's a intelligence? Or what's a, you know, wh why are we even looking at planets to begin with? You know, because aren't planets balls of rocks and gas? You know, how, how could that even mean anything? Um, one of my least favorite definitions of astrology is that it works by synchronicity. That's not a definition. <laughs> Synchronicity is not a cause. Um, I mean, anyway, so the, the book talks about all, all of these things. Um, and, you know, how does this fit in with, you know, hermeticism in general? Why, you know, how does, astro how does astrology fit in with the magic? And how does magic fit in with astrology? Um, it, you know, the, the ancient world was not this specialized, um, did not take things as, as specialized as people do today. Um, I, don't, I don't expect people to become magicians or astrologers based on reading Agrippa. But I would hope that whatever it is that they do, that they will be able to approach this in a more, um, I hate to say the word intelligent, because that sounds demeaning, but in a more um, reasoned way. Um, again, it's not about what Agrippa literally says, it's about the questions that he's asking. Um, you know, I hope that people will develop a um, I guess more of an inquiry on you know, on their own. <laughs> what I love about medieval as well as Renaissance authors, probably literally up until the 17th century, was that there was this deep internal inclination towards asking the question, why? Why are things the way they are? Why is this astrology built the way it is? Why is there any relationship between the sun and this plant? Why? It's this deep... Why are there 12 signs? Why are there 12 signs of the zodiac, which we find if we read Abraham Ibn Ezra or Guido Bonatti, mm -hmm. this, this understanding how our astrology and fundamentally also our magic is built on an observation of nature yeah. and it's a wonderful question this this question of why and to our detriment i think we stopped asking why when we moved into the 18th century and as we moved into the 19th and the 20th century we started asking why in a way that was devoid of any relationship to antiquity or well, the original a, wise became discredited precisely the original wise <laughs> surely became discredited so yeah. so we became detached our question of why became detached from the wellspring of why mm. that went before it and so what we ended up with was this this pop philosophy or this pop astrology that really didn't have any vital root or connection to the past so, but that, and that's the thing, you know, that these the basic elements of astrology are all explainable as to why they are the way they are. Um, I think the only mystery are the terms, uh, to my knowledge. If anybody figures that out, um, William Ramsey, William Ramsey on his. Did you talk about that? William Ramsey in okay, his book that. on Monday in astrology, as well as elections, he speaks about the why of the terms. But I mean, truthfully, Ptolemaic terms, though. <laughs> Ptolemaic terms, which, which confession, I use Ptolemaic terms to great effect, even though I know that 
within the standard revival of traditional astrology it's it's poo-pooed on but i actually you're use wrong you're wrong it's okay <laughs> precisely but i but, but i actually use them my client work and that's how i can justify that because if you look at the term of someone's ascendant using i mean i you know I use Ptolemaic terms, but in using Ptolemaic terms, looking at the term of someone's ascendant, that has a coloring to the nature of that person. It it it, it adds a color to the temper or the complexion of that person in a mm -hmm. way that's oftentimes uncanny. So I use Ptolemaic terms until yeah, such fine. a time as it stops working. But, 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 but. I, in answering your question, yes, William Ramsey does speak about why the terms are laid out that way. And it seems a bit forced in certain areas, like, okay, <laughs> well, the, the first six degrees of Libra is ruled by Saturn, because Saturn is the exaltation ruler and the triplicity ruler, and then up until 11 degrees is ruled by Venus, because Venus is the next strongest planet. It, it I mean, that kind of flows, but then when you get into others, it's like, mm, that logic doesn't seem like it floats. Yeah. But, I mean, actually, I missed that with Ramsey, um, mm -hmm. which is fine. I'm fine, fine being corrected there. Um, <laughs> but my, my, my point is that it, it all has a logic to it. Yes, yes, Except yes. for maybe the terms. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but really, and, and magic should be too. So, it, it, you know, none of this stuff really should be kind of like random, you know, I'm going to do this out of nowhere. Um, that's one of the things that, that I was – that. I think African religions get really good at is that everything has a a logic to it, and, and and some of that logic isn't even magic. I mean, some of that logic is, well, we have to prepare food out of this, so let's, let's do that. But um, but the thing is, is that and actually, Agrippa does talk about some of the logic too. When he's not with the magic, more more of the astrology. Um, but it's it's important to understand that, and I, and that's one of the things we've gotten away from too. You know, is is that that inner logic of why why are we doing any of this stuff to begin with? And it's it's kind of made people kind of make things up, you know, in weird ways, uh, or they disregard things because they think it's not important. Um, I, I do agree with a lot of grimoire purists that m probably most of what they're saying in the books should be done as much as possible. Um, but like I've said before, we don't know what wasn't said, and, you know, and with astrology, I think that, you know, most people are pretty, most of the books pretty much have a, what they're saying, you know, is valid, you know, um, you know, talk, look at Lily, for instance, I mean, it makes sense what he's saying, but, you know, it doesn't always apply to every chart and there's all these weird exceptions that come up and, um, but learning, learning the why is, is important or, or, you know, why, um, um, you know, how, how does how does astrology even work to begin with, which I know is the famous question that everybody <laughs> asks, but but I mean, it doesn't really fit into any kind of modern worldview whatsoever, because now we know the planets, you know, are rock and gas and and and, and the aspects are all geocentric <laughs> um, and uh, don't really exist elsewhere in nature in, in the universe. <laughs> um, so, you know, why does this have any relevance to us whatsoever? And why should we even like bother with it if it doesn't have a universal truth to it? Um, and I think that, you know, people have to develop those answers for themselves. Uh, and, 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 and again, in a very intelligent way, that's, that's why I kind of made the joke about synchronicity. It's like, well, synchronicity is not a cause, you know, it's like, you can't, the things don't work off of synchronicity. Synchronicity is a result of something. And synchronicity is oftentimes thrown around as a cop-out when I don't know the answer of this question, then the answer will always be C. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. It, it, the, the example um, that I did, that I did not make up. This is someone else's example. Uh, where synchronicity is where you have two alarm clocks. One has a bell with no hands. This is real alarm clocks, not the phone. Um, a bell with no hands, and the other clock has hands and no bell, and they're both set to the exact same time, so that when the hands of one clock reach a certain time, the bell of the other one goes off at the same time. That's synchronicity. But then, then it begs the question is, who set the clock? <laughs> so. Yes. And that is the right question. I have my personal theory as to why I think astrology works, which is framed within my larger study of pre-Socratic philosophy and hermeticism and 
And so I have a working theory for myself, but at the end of the day, we all essentially have to figure out, have, have to figure out, and we have to figure it out mm -hmm. by asking these questions of why. But I think that what's really special about the 21st century is that there are so many people taking up this Herculean task of doing the translation projects and you are amongst them and we have Ben Dykes and we have so many people who are actively sitting down Stephen and Skinner. saying, Stephen Skinner, yes, yeah, Stephen, <laughs> Stephen, who was on the show. We have yeah. so many people sitting down and saying, hey, I'm going to give back to society something that's really a valid part of our tradition, which is the teachings of these teachers who ask those questions why before us. And they've really done the work. And I'm so grateful that I have the work of Guido Bonatti to plug into and that I have the work of so many medieval astrologers. Well, and Bonatti. Yeah, and, and Renaissance astrologers. Yes. And then Moran, he came up and he started asking why in the 17th century in a way that completely blew people away because his philosophy was so rich and so unique as well. But I'm so grateful that we have so many people who've asked the question why and we have them to draw on as we create our own framework around how we are going to further ask that question why in the future. So yeah, there's, there's an interesting clue in Agrippa. Um, I haven't really seen anybody else talk about it. I, I suppose someone besides myself has, but um, he's quoting um, a passage from Iamblichus from on the Egyptian mysteries. Um, but there's a statement, and, and Iamblichus just says it as a throwaway, basically, that um, he discusses diamonds, which um, I think the other English translation translated to spirit, but um, but the diamond is sort of like a, a lower level. Well, to, to Agrippa, it would have been a lower level spirit that's more terrestrial, uh, not necessarily evil or, or, or good for that matter. Uh, they, were, they were both. Um, I mean, I could go into what the ancient Greeks thought it was, but anyway. Um, but anyway, so but he, they talk about how everyone has a personal diamond, uh, a good and an evil one. And then there are also diamonds of... Um, of diamond is D-A-E-M-O-N. So I talk fast, so I'm not saying diamond. <laughs> we got um, it. So you, yeah, so you have a, a, a diamond of a place. But then he goes into saying that, that you have a diamond of profession. So that if your personal good diamond is in sync with a diamond of profession, then you'll have a successful profession. And, uh, and the same thing with place and everything else. And he then has this throwaway line that astrologers have ways of finding out who this is. And it got me thinking, I'm like, okay, wait a minute. So if there's a diamond of profession and astrologers have a way of determining what this is, although he doesn't say how, that got me thinking about the, astro the, the natal charts or, or, the, or the significators of the natal charts in a way, the astrological significator for that, for that diamond. And, um, uh, and that, that's kind of implicitly, you know, I guess it's implicitly there in traditional astrology. There's a, a line that Chris Warnock has quoted um, from a book that is not translated in English, just this one passage. Um, it's an Arabic text, but it says, you know, something to the effect, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, come with me, Hermes, you know, or come with me to the house of Hermes, where we will talk about the heavens. Uh, not the not the heavens of astronomers, but the heavens of you know philosophers. And to me, that's the key to astrology: is that it is not astronomy in the sense we're using astronomy, just like tarot cards are using physical cards, um, or any other divinations using using something physical. Uh, but it's it's it, that's not what makes it actually work. Um, it's the it's the the unseen spiritual component. Um, so it isn't that you know the you know the moon's a, a dead ball, ball of rock. Well, there's a spirit associated with the moon that we're dealing with. Um, you know, if you move to a different planet, we'd figure that out from scratch. <laughs> well, it's a good thing that we're on this planet and that we don't have to figure it out from scratch. I'm not and... worry about it. <laughs> 
Eric, it has truly been a pleasure being able to sit with you today and really hear your thoughts and really get to flesh out some of this conversation with you because it definitely should be an ongoing conversation about how do we integrate astrology into a larger magical paradigm? How do we mm -hmm. teach astrology? How are we imparting the spirit of astrological wisdom to our students? That is far more than just giving them a recording, but how do we create this modern day effect of being in a symposium with a teacher and being in an apprenticeship? How do we bring that back? So these were all very amazing topics and very meaningful and necessary topics for us to have spoken about. And I'm really grateful to have had this opportunity to speak with you about this today. Same here. <laughs> now, Eric, for our listeners and viewers who want to plug more deeply into your work, what are some of the services that you offer and how can we find you? Okay. My uh, website is my name. So ericperdue.com. You have to spell it correctly, not like the chicken. <laughs> um, Agrippa is estimated by the current estimates uh, will be out um, probably by the spring. Um, there's been some background machinations going on here. So, um, so that'll be out soon. And uh, I do have uh, an article in a book published by Three Hands Press called uh, On the Celestial Art. Um, on my article is about uh, calculating your uh, diamond names from a chart based on Agrippa, uh, both the planetary significator and the names of them, which is super spooky. I use William Burroughs as an example. <laughs> so yeah, my website is ericperdue.com and uh, I'm on the internet all over the place and um, I'm pretty easy to get a hold of. Awesome sauce, Eric. Well, I'm going to put your website down below in the description box for our viewers and listeners to get in contact with you because definitely I think more people should be plugging into this work with you because you truly have done the work and it shows. Oh, thank you. It doesn't feel that way some days. <laughs> well, well, well. It's part of magic. It's part of magic, actually. <laughs> Precisely. Some days we're on top of the mountain and we feel as if we've done it. And then other days we stub our toenail and we drop back down to the bottom of the mountain <laughs> again. And it's all a part of the journey. Yes. <laughs> and for our listeners and viewers out there, if this is your hundredth time joining us here on the Oraculous True Divination podcast, or if this is time number one, I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming and continuing to share in this virtual astrological and magical space with us. I receive your encouragement, your feedback, your support, and most importantly, I receive your love. So if you want to continue to be a part of the magic and the momentum that we're building here on the Oraculous True Divination podcast, give yourself a moment, go down below, and yes, do like this video, but also subscribe to the Oraculous True Divination podcast and share this video with your other astrologically and magically minded colleagues and friends, because more and more people need to know about these amazing conversations that we're having with astrologers and magicians and mystics from all around the world. So until next time, I'm your host, Michael A. Bryan, leaving you in peace and love and hope until we meet again. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Eric Perdue. Yes. We survived. Whew, we survived. <laughs>